gather here in your presence because of your promise when you say that whenever two or three are gathered together in my name there, I am in the midst of them. So Lord, open our hearts to you, to your presence. May your grace proceed and follow us here. Make room in us, our hearts, O Lord, and our minds, for that which you would desire to impart to us and through us. And so we say, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. If there are lessons in the Bible that are more countercultural than the ones that we have this morning, I'm not sure I would know what they are. Everything about what our culture teaches us has a lot to do with both self-image and self-confidence. The capacity to think clearly, to act with decisiveness, to be able to carve out a path for yourself in life, to know where you're going and be able to talk about it with some articulate clarity, and to be able to not only talk about it, but, not, but actually begin to make it happen. You know, the worst thing you could say about somebody is say, well, you know, they're big talkers, but it doesn't mean that nothing is, anything is actually happening in their lives. Jesus is trying to do something very different with us if we name the name of Jesus. What Jesus is trying to actually do in us is both break down our own self-confidence and build up in us our confidence in him. And both are necessary. You actually can't have it both ways. Whereas you can't, on the one hand, be confidently independent and at the same time confident in God. They're, they're mutually exclusive. Instead, if we are to walk with God's confidence, there is a kind of inevitable breaking that occurs where we experience things in our lives that actually cause us to question our commitment, our clarity, our self-judgment, and perhaps even what it is that we actually believe about God. A part of what's happening, and this occurred in a conversation I just had with one of the people being confirmed, there is a kind of letting go that occurs. Uh, people who are raised up in the life of the church rely profoundly on the faith of their parents or whoever it was that was presenting them in baptism. But then there comes that time in that person's life where the responsibility can no longer be merely on the faith of the parents. It has to be owned by that person to whom baptism was administered years ago. And so there's a letting go of that kind of reliability to discover a kind of reliability in God. But for that to happen, there actually has to be an admission of need. I need God in my life. I need God to do for me what I know I cannot do for myself. I need God to work in me what is not possible merely by human resolve, merely by personal effort. Um, it, it could actually be possible, you see, even with this morning's lessons, and especially the, con to coll the collect, to preach in a way that would be directly contrary to Scripture. Because the colleague says, Lord, we pray that your grace may proceed and follow us, that we may be continually given to good works. It would be terribly tempting, but entirely unbiblical, for the preacher at that point to say, good works? Hear that? Get out there. It would be, at best, an incomplete sermon. That's for sure. Because, you see, if, if I'm to be given to the kind of works that are described in the scripture that has to do in a very poignant way with the description that Jesus has with his disciples at the end of the gospel reading after the young man could, no, could not give up what was asked of him by Jesus. And he talks about how hard it is to enter into the kingdom of God. And he's specifically talking about people of wealth, but 
in our culture, we all fit that category, at least in the way that Jesus describes it. Meaning, people who walk with a level of reliability on their capacity to get things done, and as a result, to be able to accumulate income, and to be able to have a certain level of certainty about the future, because their investments are doing well, or they have the kind of job that they can count on in terms of the future. Those are the kinds of things, particularly in Jesus' day, that would describe what they would consider a person of wealth, which is most people within the United States. Not everybody by any stretch of the imagination, but many. And the reason for that is, is because there is a level of self-reliability that they have cultivated, talents that they have developed, that allow them to have that kind of certainty about the future. And Jesus says it is about those people that he says how hard it is to enter into the kingdom of God. Because you see, to enter into the kingdom of God is that profound admission that no matter what I accomplish in my life, it could all be taken away. That's the story of Job. Job was a man of profound wealth, a strong marriage, healthy kids. All kinds of people thought him blessed, a man of deep integrity, well thought of by his community, an upstanding citizen, by anybody's description, and bang, it was all gone. But what we see in Job, even in the midst of his cries to God, is his willingness to engage with God even his, in his darkest moments, when all he could think of is the fact that God had turned against him. For many, especially if, they're, if they sort of use God to get what they want, that's not entering in the kingdom, by the way, then if they don't get what they want, then that means what they do is they turn their back on God because God isn't treating them the way that they would like. It, do, you hear, do you hear how self-serving that is? That kind of posture before God is still, in the end, all about me. What I need, what I want, and therefore what I expect from God. After all, look what I'm doing for him. That, that is part and parcel with the level of self-reliance that Jesus is speaking so clearly against. Because you see, to enter into the kingdom of God, is exactly the opposite attitude. This is why Jesus, just prior to this, actually in the Gospel of Mark, raises up in his example a child. And he says, except as you become as a little child, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. What's a description? What is the one word that you would use for a small child? It's dependence. The child needs to be held cared for, provided for, guided, literally every step of the way. And especially when that child, we saw that, my wife and I were at my wife's family reunion over the weekend, and there were a lot of little two and three year olds running around, several, and you know, you'd, they'd be there and they'd be holding, you know, mom or dad or some relative's hand and bang, they'd want to take off. You know, completely oblivious. You know, to whatever dangers they might encounter. So what, is the, what does the adult do? Man, the, ch the adult goes running. And at that point, usually swoops up that child so that child doesn't go tearing out the door outside or into the kitchen where anything could happen. It, it's, it's that kind of need that is, in fact, the description of someone who qualifies for the kingdom of God. And, and for us self-reliant adults... That means that a kind of breakage has to happen where our we begin to question our capacity for our own ability to ably rely on ourselves. And out of that, it thrusts us in a far deeper way into a new place of dependence. That's God at work. If there is anything that describes the answer to the prayer, oh Lord, let your grace proceed and follow us. If God's actually doing that in your life, what you do experience from time to time is precisely that kind of breakage where 
I can't rely on myself. I've, I've come up short. I, didn't, I wasn't able to do what I thought. I couldn't keep the commitment that I thought perhaps I was able to make, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, there's this kind of, God, if you don't break through, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. And that works in us that kind, the kind of humility, the kind of tender heartedness toward God that actually causes us to see our circumstances and other people in a different light. We actually become far more quick to forgive, far more able to, what's the word that Paul says, to make allowances for one another. We, far, we become far more open to seeing the need that is around us. Our hearts become tender to other people's troubles and difficulties. And it is exactly that kind of inner tenderness coupled with this kind of humility, which is the fruit of real brokenness, that actually is the person that God chooses to use in his service. So to pray, Lord, may your grace proceed and follow us that we may be continually given to good works is actually an invitation for breakage, for humility, and a new capacity to be able to see and to give. That's what flows through all of these readings. And because I know that even in my darkest moments, God is present, it is exactly that confidence that gives me the capacity when needed to be bold, to take out and to take risks, to be more adventurous than ever I thought might be true in the past, because I know that even in my darkest moments, he is there and, and God will in fact provide and show me what is necessary to be able to face this difficulty, that circumstance, to, to take a risk and meet a need in another person. Those are the gifts of what are given to me in the capacity of being able by God's mercy to be that tender hearted. And as a result, see God do extraordinary things. Today, two people are presenting themselves for confirmation. In some ways, especially within the context of these lessons, these two and the rest of us who are renewing our own commitments that we have made in baptism and confirmation are faced again with the choice, are we willing to allow God to both break and restore, to be able to pull down so that he might tenderize, to be able to pull away from us the capacity for the kind of self-reliance that we may have had in the past so that we might be more available to see the need and as a result be available in a new way for God's good works and service. These are not easy lessons. These are kinds of things I must confess that from time to time I wish weren't there. But the truth of the matter is, is that the eye of the needle is the only possibility. The only one. And that God who loves us actually far better than we love ourselves is profoundly committed to doing whatever is necessary to squeeze us through and to reshape us and use us for his service. Uh, we can be hard-hearted, resist and say no. But if we are even remotely truthful to the words that we have said in this building, and including what we will say today, God will take seriously that cry that is actually deeper than our own hard-heartedness and begin to work something new even in the wreckage of my own self-reliance. So, this is an invitation to say yes to a capacity both to be broken to be humbled and to be used because that is in fact the way of the kingdom of God. Amen.